Okay, let's, let's get things started. Um, we have a second speaker. Uh, he is Professor Noel Clemens. He's now holding the Bob Dorsey Professorship in Department of Aerospace Engineering and Engineering Mechanics at U of Texas at Austin. He got a PhD from Stanford University in 1991 and joined U of Texas Austin in 1993. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, thank everyone for, uh, for inviting me here. Uh, it's really been a great uh, uh, visit. Uh, the, as uh, Bob said, the facilities here are really just uh, unbelievable. But, um, okay, so I'm going to talk about kind of a, a thing that we've been working on for a few years, and it's, it's actually really, a, to me, a very fun uh, project. There's just interesting uh, physics. And uh, in, what I'm doing is will be kind of like the diagnostics are kind of guided by the, the physics, and, you know, sort of improving our understanding of what's, what's happening. Um, and the, the, I'm also going to discuss some, and based on some discussions yesterday, some work that we're, we've done. I added a few slides on, on soot, and, uh, um, and that'll just be at the beginning. So it sort of doesn't fit the title of this, of this talk. But, so the, the people who actually do the work are, are down here. Um, here, Dominic, and he's here actually, and uh, Rakesh Ranjan, and, and these guys are, are Dominic is almost everything I've shown up here. And Rakesh has been doing the high pressure combustion work. Akju Park and uh, Ross Burns worked on the, the Krypton Plif. So let me um, um, discuss the Krypton Plif for a bit. So uh, Krypton Plif is is a kind of a newish technique, and it's something that um, Jonathan Frank and I uh, had developed. And it's not that the the in, in its four uh, we developed the use of Krypton PLIF for a conserved scalar marker in, uh, in flames. And uh, the idea is that you have a, um, a so if you have a species that is, is truly inert, then it doesn't participate in the reactions and it is, it is actually uh, conserved. So it's already a conserved scalar if you can measure it uh, quantitatively. And it just so happens there are some uh, noble gases um, that, that can be um, accessed with two photon um, absorption transitions. And so, for example, Krypton's accessed at uh, 214.7 nanometers. Xenon's is a little easier to access near 225, but it's way more expensive if you're going to seed it into a, a flow. Okay, so the, the um, idea, though, is that, is that you're taking this conserved scalar, and then you're able to derive the mixture fraction from it, and, uh, and then potentially, since you're doing imaging, you can get scalar dissipation. So that, that would be the big thing that we'd, we'd like to do. And um, so we demonstrated this, um, uh, the using Krypton uh, PLIF in um, uh, the, the uh, Sandia Dibble flame and uh, showed that it actually worked quite well and we compared it to Raman, uh, the, the classical Raman uh, data and show, shown that, that it had a very good agreement. We've been doing a lot of work with sort of um, looking at the, the scalar dissipation that's derived from it and also that's, that's looking quite good also. Now we've shown that it works with, um, in supersonic flows very well also. You know, there was just a tracer, and it's very good as a sort of an alternative to NO. And the, the advantage over NO is it doesn't kill you. And so the, the, there are a lot of like, it's beginning, you know, use in a lot of sort of in the US and national labs and things where they, they just dealing with these toxic gases is a big problem. Um, it is harder to use and because it's a two photon uh, process. Uh, and, uh, but it, it, it actually works quite well, as you, as you can see there. And this is a supersonic mixing um, experiment. Okay, so what we're doing it now is, it, is extending it to its use to, or seeing if it can be extended uh, to be used in sooting flames. And the idea is, can you make measurements in, in sooting flames of mixture fraction together with, for example, soot volume fraction? Okay, so this is an experiment. We have a uh, ethylene flame and uh, we've, uh, it's diluted with nitrogen, and then uh, we're adding uh, krypton to it. And we're looking down here in the soot in inception region, and it, it, there's reasons why we're down here that's probably not gonna work too well up here due to the, the radiation cooling. Um, so what we have then is we're doing um, uh, simultaneous measurements, krypton, plif, PIV, and LII. So we have our uh, PIV cameras, we have an LII camera that's excited by one of the PIV uh, laser sheets, and then we have a very small um, 214.7 uh, nanometer beam that is for exciting the, the Krypton uh, PLIF. So we're doing this uh, simultaneously. The idea is we're getting mixture fraction 
and, uh, and then from the mixture fraction get temperature, and then, and then we're getting velocity, and then soot volume fraction all together. Okay, so one problem, one thing we didn't know if it, if it would work with, or we just get too much interference from PAH fluorescence, and we thought maybe it would be okay because it's way down on the, on the um, absorption curve, um, but it turns out that it, it actually, there's substantial uh, fluorescence from PAH. So this is the, kind of the krypton beam is here, and this is without any krypton, and, and that's the, the PAH fluorescence. Um, this, actually, this krypton plus signal, I don't, it's not saturated like that. I, I don't know. Uh, it's just this rendering here is not, not very good. Um, but uh, basically, the krypton plif signal is uh, this, you know, about 10 times higher than the, the PAH. But as you get out, you know, outward at, with, at lower mixture fractions, it can be comparable. And so it's an issue with what we're doing right now. We think we can improve it substantially by reducing our uh, filter width. Um, we're, we're letting in too much of the pH fluorescence. We also had a, um, uh, we're, we'll be able to improve our, uh, with our laser, we're only hitting this with two millijoules right now for, for at 214.7. We had a flood in our lab and it actually destroyed some of our lasers and, uh, and so we, we were kind of limping along here when we did this. So this is more proof of concept. Okay, so this is still fluorescence and fluorescence has the problem with uh, quenching and, uh, and so that, that it doesn't change here, even though we have this conserved scalar in the flow, um, it's still quenched. And so that sort of, in a sense, makes it not conserved, but uh, you, could, you could argue, and, uh, but, it, but technically it is, if you measure it in the flow, it was not produced or destroyed. It was uh, originated in the jet stream. Okay, so what we do then is we measure the fluorescent signal, and, uh, which is in the flow, but then we also measure it at a reference location. That reference location is the jet exit, where, where you appear a jet fluid that's uh, cold. You no and so you normalize all your, your signals by that reference condition. And then you, we, can, we use a state relationship, and it's derived from an opposed flow of flame. And, and we, you know, we use a strain rate, a measured strain rate of 1,000 inverse seconds, but it sort of it's not very sensitive to that. And so we can map then our normalized fluorescent signal to mixture fraction and then to uh, temperature and, uh, you know, by, by using th this uh, state relationship. Now, you do need the state relationship, and that's definitely a drawback, so it's going to have limited use, but where it can be used, it may be very effective, okay? So just for an example, this is some data. This is a velocity field uh, here. These are just two same velocity field. This is an, an LAI signal, the soot volume fraction. And this little strip here is the uh, krypton plif that's been mapped to, using the state relationship, to mixture fraction. Now, we had to measure, we have to have all the quenching rates measured, in which we did, we, we've done that. And, uh, but, so when we get out of it is mixture fraction is here. Stoichiometric mixture fraction is 0.128, and that's a down here. This line is what's called the stoichiometric velocity. And it's the only contour I'm actually showing of, of the, from the velocity field. And that's something people in combustion don't use too much, but, but um, there is a relationship between the stoichiometric velocity and the stoichiometric mixture fraction that actually works pretty well for locating where the reaction zone is. People don't believe it, but, but it, it does work. Um, and so the stoichiometric velocity is just the jet velocity times the stoichiometric mixture fraction. So what we see is that the stoichiometric um, uh, mixture fraction is right you know, the, uh, very similar to this stoichiometric velocity, which is kind of interesting. Actually, I didn't think it'd be that close. Um, and then uh, when we, so we can have the mixture fraction, we can then go to map it to temperature using our state relationship. And so we're saying that, you know, that essentially the flame is, is here. And uh, you see the correlation is quite, quite good, with, which is, as you'd expect, because you could just, this is derived directly from the mixture fraction. So. Um, the the uh, beauty of this then is you're getting this multi you know uh, uh, parameter information um, and uh, and you can now do kind of correlations with it. Um, this is just uh, some validation. This is uh, uh, we did some thermocouple scans um, and uh, and then just taking then we have the derived temperature from the from the krypton plif signal and the state relationship, just showing that they agree pretty well. So we think this is a very promising technique for looking at soot in the soot inception region for sort of kind of simple uh, jet flames. Um, from this, we can get um, simultaneous velocity fields, um, soot volume fraction mixture fraction, um, scalar dissipation, 
uh, temperature and thermal dissipation. Okay, and these are things that are needed for the modeling. And so, so uh, we, you know, we're, we're kind of still developing this, but it, but it definitely uh, seems promising. Okay, so let me get to the, the, the main topic, and that's the flashback. And so, um, flashback has been studied for, for many years. I mean, there, there's a nice model that was developed uh, by uh, Lewis and Von Elby in the, in the 40s. And, uh, and so, essentially, it's just the upstream uh, propagation in uh, premixed flames. And uh, so, kind of the most the simplest uh, form of that is just in a, say, a channel flow where it's non swirling. And so, this is just an example where you have a flame here and it's going to go into the channel. And a um, very nice uh, example of that is from the recent DS DNS by Andreas uh, uh, Gruber and uh, Andrea Gruber and uh, um, Jackie Chen, and in a, in a, uh, a channel flow. Now, um, uh, Saddlemeyer's done a lot of work in this also experimentally that actually <coughs> precedes this. Um, and, uh, and I'll discuss some, some of their findings more uh, later on. Um, there's also uh, uh, swirling core flow. And uh, flashback has is, is, uh, been shown to occur like this, where you have a, essentially a flame that's going to flash back. And it does that through the central core through a vortex breakdown, a combustion-induced vortex breakdown process. And so the presence of the flame is changing the pressure gradient and causing it to break down. And it, it sort of makes the, the flashback easier. It affects its own propagation. And that's something that we'll keep on seeing in, in the flashback uh, process. Um, so what we're interested in is this. Um, is the confined swirling flow. It's kind of an annular uh, flow where you're swirling in this annulus here. And when it flashes back, it's more of a boundary layer type. It's, it's, it's rather than in a core flow, it flashes back in the boundary layer. Um, this is a good example of that. This is by uh, Saddlemeyer and uh, Andreas here, um, where they did high-speed PIV to look at, at uh, uh, flashback. And uh, this, is, this is similar to what I'm going to be uh, showing um, in terms of uh, at least a technique. Okay, so we're looking at boundary layer flashback and swirl combustors. Uh, we're trying to investigate the physics of, of flashback. Um, we're looking at methane air flames and hydrogen flames. In fact, the funding is for the hydrogen enriched flames. Um, and, it, and it's also for developed uh, models, improved uh, LES models. It was, it's in collaboration with Venkat Araman here. And, uh, and then we're also looking at the effect of elevated pressures. And I, you know, we, we'll go to 10 atmospheres, and so whether that's high or not, not, not high by, uh, by, the, by the standards of some of these uh, facilities um, that we've been hearing about. OK, so this is our uh, combustor. And it, uh, it essentially is a, a swazzle, like Tony was discussing. You have a swirl veins with holes in it where you inject fuel, and the air is, is, is passed through here and is swirled. It can, goes into a mixing tube, and so the swazzle is used just to keep, keep it from flashing back farther, you know, farther back would be more dangerous. And uh, so this, this region is a mixing tube, and then here's the main uh, combustor for the, the single burner uh, configuration that we're, we're, we're modeling. Now, the, the, uh, um, when you're using the swaddle, swazzle where you're, you're injecting the, the fuel, it's a pretty interesting problem because you have essentially non-premixed uh, reactants down here, it's premixed up here, so when the flame is flashing back, it's actually going from fully, you know, premixed to 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 essentially stratified to a partially premixed to a fully non-premixed. So I think the model, the the LES models that are trying to predict this, this have to have to actually handle that, and that that's one one uh, uh, reason that we were interested in this configuration. For our purposes now, we are not using, we're not injecting through these holes. We're just uh, passing um, fully premixed re uh, reactants through the swirl veins, and that's just to, um, to so it's, simpl it's simpler to understand what's going on, because we started doing it, we realized we didn't know if we were looking at stratification effects um, or other effects. Okay, so this is what it looks like um, in the lab, and so the, uh, this is the, the swirl veins, this is the mixing tube, so we're looking at flashback into this mixing tube here, this is where the, com the uh, flame is going to stabilize. Um, so how do we induce flashback? There's different ways that you could do it. You could lower the, the velocity. Um, you could, and, uh, and what we do um, is to uh, increase the equivalence ratio. That uh, if you're very lean, or if you're lean, and then you increase the equivalence ratio, you're going to have an increased propensity for flashback. And so we first start, we create a stable flame that's lean. And then we increase, kind of create a step change um, in the mass flow rate with our mass flow meter. And, uh, and so then it goes above the critical um, equivalence ratio for flashback, it then flashes back. And so it's sort of something that also can be done with the, uh, 
with the LES. Um, so if we want to um, see what it looks like, that, so I'm going to just show a movie here. So this is the same geometry here, okay, so the, okay. And I don't have a mouse. I should have tested. <coughs> okay, so um, if you're going to look at this is a fee of 0.6, it then goes a fee of 0.9, and then it flashes back. That's just sort of what your eye sees. And, uh, and this is going to be a slow motion version. It's kind of it's just, it, 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 so it's flashing back along that center body. Like along, and the reason for that is that the boundary layer is thickest there. Flow is, in a sense, slower, so it's, it's taking the path of least resistance. It's easier to propagate there. Okay, so that's what it looks like to your eye, but this is what it looks like with high speed uh, chemiluminescence. Um, so that's a stable flame, it's going to start flashing back. You can see it, it's, it's swirling around the center body, it's hugging the center body. And uh, um, it kind of has these tongues that are leading, and they're following the swirl direction. They're, they're, going, they're swirling around the, those tongues as they are uh, propagating. So we do um, high-speed um, PIV with chemiluminescence imaging um, to, to look at this. And um, I'm, I'm going to just uh, skip through this. Um, we're doing four, four kilohertz imaging in this case. So we use a, a fairly standard technique. We use, we seed with olive oil and then we, uh, you know, of course it burns up in the, in the flame and so we just take that interface and we, and we use that to derive the, the flame front. And of course that's valid, it works quite well um, it, it right here at the flame tip. And it's not so good down here, farther downstream, um, just because the hot products can convect and uh, you don't know where they came from. But right, if you're, as long as you're right here at the tip, you're, you're doing okay in terms of locating the flame front, at least for our purposes. Um, so this is an example where we're looking just at the exit of the, of the uh, mixing tube. And if we play this, we're going to see the flame is going to come in from the top. And it's hugging the center body there. It always has this kind of this concave shape and uh, uh, when it's moving downwards. And you'll see this kind of low velocity region in front. But look what happens with the flow outside. See, it's getting displaced as that flame comes down. The flame is a disturbance, and uh, it, is, it, is, it is causing blockage, and so it causes the flow to move out. Now, one of the, the sort of the challenges in understanding the physics of this is that what we see here, and we're seeing one plane, so we see the flow sort of deflect, but it, it, sees, it sees the flame, and it can actually adjust in 3D. So maybe the most in, you know, important things that affects the propagation happens out of the plane. And, so, and also it can even affect the flow that's inflowing from the swirlers. And so it's possible we need to monitor what's happening with the, with the velocity field you know, while the flame is flashing back to sort of see how the flow structure is changing. So the other thing that you see is you'll see like a high velocity, it's down here, then you see a high velocity region, kind of high momentum is, is sweeping in and pushes it downstream. So it's being pushed by the flow and it's pushing the flow around. It's a coupled system. It and so in a sense it's affecting its own propagation. Okay, so let's look now at, at um, a sequence. And you go, well, here's the flame, it's coming down, moves down, it's moving, you know, and you kind of, you could, you could get the velocity from that if you'd like. And um, if you did that, you'd be uh, totally wrong uh, for this reason, that if you look at the luminosity, oops, <laughs> I had to disconnect this, um, that if you look at the luminosity, that the flame, it, you, there, there's the laser sheet here, and um, the, flame, the flame is actually behind the center body. So you look at this, you go, there's no flame, it must be up here. And in fact, that's wrong, it's behind the center body. It's just rotating around it, and when it first, crosses it is up here, so you see it just show up there, actually off the wall, and then it moves, it moves over and it's crossing about the middle, and so you see it there, and it crosses down right here, and uh, you see it move down. Only here is where it's actually useful for us. In other words, that we want the flame tip to cross the laser sheet. Here we have useful information. Here we have nothing. Um, nothing useful can, can be derived from this. Here, we can, for example, know what the, what the velocity is at the flame tip. We could do, look at the next frame, get the velocity of the flame front, 
um, we can get the displacement velocity uh, from that. Okay, so um, this is now just a sequence showing that the, the flame is rotating through following the swirl, and uh, I'm going to stop it right when it crosses the laser sheet. This is where we like it. And so when you do that, you'll see there's this low velocity region in front of it, and there's this uh, zero velocity line is here, and it's negative velocity. So it's negative axial velocity. And that tends to be, we, should, we see that whenever it's propagating downwards, it's negative axial velocity. That is not new in the least. Um, that has been shown um, in, in, uh, in other studies. Uh, it was actually first shown by a Saddle Myers group in this uh, channel flow uh, with PIV. And it's, it's a lot of work has been done in that by the uh, Andrea Gruber and Jackie Chen. And so, and it's due to the, the blockage effect of the flame, the flow expansion. And so the, fl the streamlines come in, there's less mass here, so the flow has to deflect around it. And, they, and, and some people speak of it as a, as a separation, boundary layer separation, which it's not. Um, and uh, uh, Gruber talks about it as being more like a put piston is just pushing the flow. Um, or you can think of it almost like a pitot probe. And, uh, uh, but it's, so it's causing negative velocity, and the, and the view is that, that, um, that the presence of the flame is creating this negative velocity, which is helping it propagate. So it needs that to propagate upstream. So it's affecting its own propagation. Um, so this was, all <laughs> this was also shown um, here, and uh, this is in a swirling flame, and this is by, uh, with uh, uh, Andreas here. And uh, so, that, but in the swirling flame, you only have, you, or at least the one component of velocity is negative here, that's the axial uh, component. Okay, so um, now, so we're showing that, they're showing the negative axial velocity, but remember, if you're talking about reverse flow, that, that's actually reverse to, compared to what? It's compared to the streamwise direction. And so, and this is a swirling flow. And so the question is, if it's really truly reverse, that would mean it's reverse, it's going back in, in, the, in the opposite direction of the streamline direction. Well, we have the data and from the, three, the, the uh, three component PIV, and so we can look at the velocity along the streamline and show that it's never negative. So it's not actually reversed in the case of the swirling flow. Um, what is it? Well, think of this, this is a, a cartoon that kind of shows what's happening. So you have the flame front, you have the normal uh, to the flame front, uh, which, is, which is where the flame is propagating in this direction. The, str the, the, the swirl streamlines are coming here. The flow is then deflected by the blockage effect, by the dilatation uh, due to the flame. It's deflected downwards like this. And so it's not reversed, it's just deflected. Right? It's, it's, it feels that uh, blockage. But that is enough to help it propagate, most likely. Um, and then when you look at the, the, the uh, superposition of this um, fl flame, uh, flame speed or flame uh, uh, vector uh, on the, in the local fluid velocity, you get this, this uh, green line here, green uh, vector, which is the, the direction that the flame is moving. So that's why the flame is moving in this direction as it's swirling. Okay, so let's compare now. This is, this is what the... Um, the uh, methane looks like it's kind of, these tongues are swirling around in the, along with the swirl, of course, in the opposite direction. Now, we also did work with um, hydrogen flames. And so this is, this is hydrogen methane. It's, the methane's just added so we can see it. It's basically just hydrogen, 97% hydrogen. And um, so what you see is, oh, oh, I'll point out that the uh, Reynolds numbers are the same and the laminar flame speeds are the same. So we got the same laminar flame speeds by going to a leaner mixture of the hydrogen than the methane. So nominally everything's the same, um, except for the, this uh, composition. So, um, and what you see is actually a different type of propagation structure. So the, um, what, what happens to these tongues, there's, first of all, there's more tongues than in the methane case, and they kind of propagate straight down, and sometimes they even propagate counter to the, to the streamwise direction, to the swirl direction. And that just doesn't happen uh, with the uh, methane. So we think the reason for that is that the quenching distance is smaller for the hydrogen, so it can actually exist in a lower velocity region, lower in the boundary layer, so it actually propagate in a, in a uh, you know, uh, 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 faster in a sense, uh, um, and go straight down the, the uh, center body. 
Uh, the other thing is that these multiple tongues we think are due to a thermal diffusive instability, and that's something that's been shown in the, in the DNS. And so as we go to high pressure, I, I do that, uh, Norbert uh, mentioned this, that he, he said that it's likely that, that at high pressure these will go, will not be as important, and I, I think that's probably right, and that's something we'll be uh, looking for. Okay, so what's kind of clear from this is that 3D measurements are, are needed for this type of flow. And so we're using uh, Tomo PIV, and uh, we do it, it's a fairly standard uh, 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 configuration. Um, we're bringing the laser sheet, we, we re retroreflect it, and this is from the side, we retroreflect it just to increase the fluence because um, of the low uh, uh, energy per pulse. The laser sheet is down here, it's about five millimeters thick, so it's like a thick laser sheet. There's the setup. And so this is at five kilohertz. So the PIV is at five kilohertz. So one thing that we did is that is we, um, we said, well, we have the 3D particle images from the reconstruction. And so can we use that to actually get the 3D flame surface? And, um, and so that uh, something that Dominic worked on for a while and, and did get it um, to work, at least, where it appears to be uh, work out pretty well. And it took a few steps, and, uh, um, and, and different things were tried. Um, but basically, he has to go through some uh, uh, various uh, processing uh, steps. And um, he does the reconstruction. And then um, one big problem are the ghost particles. And, uh, and so trying to get rid of those um, is, is, a, is a big part of this. And, uh, but, but you essentially go from the interface between where there are particles and where there's not. And of course, the, the, with the Tomo PIV, the particle spacing is pretty large. Or particle density is low. And, uh, and, and so your resolution is limited, right? So it's sort of like we take what we, we can get in this, and, uh, as you'll see. OK, so um, we then get the flame surface here, and then we smooth it, and we render it into 3D. So this is the rendered three-dimensional flame surface. Um, and let's see how well it uh, looks in a, an actual flame. Um, so this is a, the luminosity. And this, when this is the rendered flame surface that kind of uh, peaks in there as this thing rotates around. Um, here's another example. And it, you're seeing the flame surface here. And uh, one thing that's interesting is um, when you look at these, that I'm going to stop it here. And you'll see here's the, the, there's a, what appears to be a flame in the box, and there's nothing here. And that actually should be true, because that the laser sheet is like this. The flame is hugging the cylinder, so it passed through the, the sheet and then it went out of the plane. And so we, you know, we, we really, we only expect to see it in the middle here. And when you look at the general structures, that they're actually very similar in terms of what we're seeing with the, um, in terms of the, uh, between the luminosity and the, um, and, the, and the rendered flame sheet. I'm gonna skip this. And um, so, um, this is just an example where we have a, a 3D flame sheet here, and this is a, the three-dimensional streamlines. So one thing that's interesting is you see now this, there's a negative, uh, region of negative uh, axial velocity that's shown uh, just upstream. And so, the, you know, sort of there's some issue about are, is this technique working? Is that a real structure? And you go, well, it's likely a real structure because it's, it's doing something to the flow here. And uh, what you see are the streamlines are diverging. They're, they're, you know, they are deflected by the presence of that, in a sense, just like that cartoon that, that I showed earlier. So we had that cartoon you know, years before, we, we, or a year before we did this. In other words, where we, we inferred what, what happened from, uh, from the 2D measurements, but you know, we, it's in a sense confirmed with this uh, 3D uh, technique. OK, so let's see what happens with, um, when we take this to high pressure. We have a, a new uh, high pressure uh, uh, combustor. And it's not super high, uh, 10 uh, bars, you can see. Um, we've we've kind of used, we developed really to study flashback and, and stratified flames and, and the effect of, um, of stratification on uh, flashback. And we have optical access from the sides and, and even from the top. We can bring the laser sheet in from the top. In fact, we do that in what I'm going to show you. And that's just to so we can get the laser sheet close to the, to the center body wall here without getting reflections. Because the reflections are a huge uh, problem with this. Um, we're, we're probably not able to get anything if we bring the laser in from the side. OK, so um, this is just what it looks like in terms of luminosity. The, um, um, so this is the one atmosphere case. This is the four atmosphere case. And so if we just compare these, um, these aren't really synchronized. Uh, that's just sort of approximately. And uh, what you see is sort of the, gl the gross um, um, flame speed is pretty similar between these uh, two cases. 
the uh, methane case, it, it looks less wrinkled than the, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, the low pressure case looks less wrinkled than the high pressure case. You see a lot of fine scale structure in the, in the higher pressure case. One sort of big difference that you see is that the, this one atmosphere case is wider. The flame spread is larger than the uh, high pressure case, which is narrower. And uh, this is shown here, where we just have a sort of the flame, we just waited till it got about to the same location and took uh, four, uh, four uh, snapshots. And so this is one atmosphere, two, three, and four. And you see that the, the flame width is actually much larger at one atmosphere than at four atmospheres. And, and that's actually expected just because the, um, the think about the velocity profile here is much fuller, right? There's more momentum in, uh, across the, the boundary layer. And so when the, the, you have the, the flame is, is existing, it's being carried downstream, in a sense, farther than, than it was when the boundary layer is thicker. So it's just like a boundary layer. And so it has this narrower. Well, that is important if blockage, as we think, is an important part of the flame propagation mechanism. Um, and that is that this is narrower. It's a filling up less volume. There's less flow blockage. And so that may have a very strong impact on its ability to propagate upstream and flashback. So as we go to higher and higher pressure, that's what we'll be looking at. Uh, I'm going to skip this. And um, so this is some, um, uh, uh, some of the, the uh, uh, time-resolved PIV in the high-pressure combustor. This is at five atmospheres. And uh, so this is the luminescence. I don't know why this is playing so fast, Dominic. Why is it? Um, but when we, um, if I stop it, oops. Stop it here. Almost done. Um, that uh, that what you see is a smaller negative region, uh, a region of negative axial velocity than we saw with, with the um, lower pressure flames. And if we sort of compare them directly, so this is one atmosphere, this is five atmospheres, that there's this little tiny region here of negative axial velocity. It's a very thin uh, react, or, uh, you know, flame. Uh, it's a thick flame in a bigger region of negative axial velocity. So that suggests there's more blockage in the case of the, of the low pressure, less in the high pressure. Okay, so we, we think that we're, you know, that that will be important for understanding what's happening. So let me conclude. Um, so, and this is a case where the chemiluminescence is actually very valuable. And it's usually not, you know, because it's spatially integrated, but because the flame moves in front of the center body, we know exactly where it is in 3D space. And so it's really helpful. I wouldn't trade it for, uh, you know, high speed OH imaging. It wouldn't be as useful. Um, but um, so it helps guide us our, our planar measurements. Um, so at one atmosphere, the upstream flame propagation is always associated with regions of negative axial velocity, but the flow is only deflected. It's not actually reversed. Um, and then we do see, we do see dim differences between the methane and the hydrogen flames, largely um, due to the hyd hydrodynamics and inst instabilities. Um, so with, the, with pressure and Reynolds number, because that's essentially all that was changing is Reynolds number and I guess the chemistry effect uh, at pressure, um, that you have a lower flame spread rate and you have less negative axial flow near the flame front. And that just says there's less blockage to the flow, which, which should impact the, the propagation, uh, although we're not actually seeing that. But, um, so the TOMO PIV and the flame surface reconstruction looks, looks quite good, very promising for understanding uh, the, this flow. One last thing is, is this comes up um, when, in our discussions with uh, Ben Cad and, and his students and just that how do we um, use this type of data for, for validation of the models that go into the LES. And the, these kind of movies are actually not that useful for that purpose. And as Venkat was saying, that, that you have a, um, they're not correlated, the models aren't dealing with correlations in time like we're seeing here. So what, you know, what we need or something like where we're running these a thousand times looking at the flame at the same location, looking at relationships between displacement velocities and the velocities in the flow in those correlations, which um, is, you know, very daunting thing to, to, to even think about. So um, anyway, with that, I will um, conclude. <laughs>